This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. Whether you're a board member or an owner or just an interested person, uh, we hope you find a lot of value in watching our educational series about how to make your experience living in an association worthwhile, positive, and create value for your association. I do want to remind everybody that this Saturday, September 16th, from 9 to 12, the mayor is sponsoring, or I should say, uh, council members Ozawa, Kobayashi, and Fukunaga are, are sponsoring a special seminar on fire safety issues as a result of the recent fire at the Marco Polo. And they're going to be a vibrant discussion regarding the risks, the potential costs, what the issues are, and looking for a lot of public input. So if you feel compelled, please join us on September 16th at 9 a.m. You can find the address out uh, on the website. And also, if you're interested in owner, you should feel free to call our hotline, 808-374-2014, if you have any questions. But you know, we've had a lot of construction in Kaka'ako. And you know, there's been a lot of construction for decades here in Hawaii, and often we hear about construction defect litigation. In fact, I've had several <laughs> phone calls recently from attorneys talking about new issues with regard to construction litigation and some of the things that are kind of surfacing. And so I thought it might be helpful to bring in a real expert on this, a good friend of mine, Francis Lynch from Lynch Hopper. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, Richard, how are you? Good. Why don't you tell us a little bit, I know you're a lawyer, which uh, means uh, you'll drive me to drink at the best. <laughs> it's a short drive, though. <laughs> you know. So There's tell me a little bit about yourself and where you live and, and your firm. Way too many lawyers. My name is Francis Lynch. I'm an attorney. Uh, I've been an attorney for, well, it seems like forever, uh, over 25 years. Um, we have an office in Las Vegas. We have an office in Oahu probably the last six or seven years, and we just opened up an office in Maui, where I live, uh, which makes the commute so much easier for me. Um, our firm is primarily a, uh, I've got two partners, and our firm is small, uh, but we've dedicated ourselves to consumer protection issues. We've represented clients uh, on Kauai uh, against GMOs for pesticide uh, intrusion. We've represented uh, AOAOs and uh, homeowners uh, living next to golf courses where builders have taken their rights away. We represented uh, lots of homeowners uh, in Eva, Eva Basin against a builder who promised to uh, build a marina and didn't. So we do these kinds of uh, litigation. We like to call ourselves um, uh, resolution experts, construction resolution, uh, as opposed to litigators, although we litigate if we have to, uh, but it uh, is in everybody's best interest to try to solve problems as opposed to have to go to court and get somebody else on a jury to solve them for you. Well, I know there's, we all know there's laws, I mean, federal laws, state laws, laws related to construction. Believe it or not, my wife has her own set of laws. <laughs> <laughs> and the penalties for violating those are much greater than you'll find from any judge in the state of Hawaii, but you may have experienced that. There's but no uh, death penalty from the judges, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm not so sure the torture is even greater than the death penalty. But either way, kind of refresh his memory with the construction laws as far as the defect side of a car, as far as, you know, what you know, statute of limitations, what that is, and kind of how that works sure. out. In Hawaii, uh, essentially there's two statutory schemes that uh, construction defect, construction resolution, construction issues fall under. Uh, one is 672, it's the right to repair. You give the contractor the ability to come out and fix things. We all know about that law. And then the other one is 657, which talks about the statutes of limitation for all sorts of claims, not just construction issues. Um, here in Hawaii, the statute of limitations is quick. It's only two years after a homeowner or an, eight, uh, an association uh, knows or should know essentially about what a problem is. Um, that's fast. 
um, in many other states uh, that we practiced in before. It's a, a lot longer than that, and we can get into that a little bit later. Uh, there's a statute of repose in Hawaii, which uh, no matter when you find out what the problem is, it's 10 years, when you find the problem out, it doesn't matter. 10 years from the substantial completion of the project is when a homeowner is foreclosed from bringing any action at all. Um, you want me to go, I can talk about well, a little so more So what you're depth. saying is that for construction defects today, that if in fact you discover the problem, you have two years to do something, otherwise you'd be barred from pursuing the claim because you had knowledge and you did nothing about it. Or at 10 years, whether you found out or didn't find out, you're just done because of the fact the statute of repose means that I don't know why attorneys have all this way. Why don't they say ending date or something <laughs> that we all, that all the common people know? I, they, they have an entire semester to tell you the difference between limitation and repose. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, super don't, complicated. Don't, don't give me a quiz on it. <laughs> I will flunk. <laughs> you know. But 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 the reality is so basically, it seems like that's a time above the essence thing for a board. I mean, if you're a newly elected board of directors in an association and you start to experience problems. It's a serious thing that they should they should take a look at this. You should, um, and there's uh, different points of opportunity to take a look at things. You know, the first thing I tell my clients, even before their clients, they'll call me and say, you know, I, we think we have some of these issues. Uh, help us walk us through it a little bit, uh, even before they hire us. Um, the first thing I tell everybody is just take a deep breath. You know, you're in a board. Uh, you have a ton of homeowners there and they're your best resource. Uh, sometimes they'll complain to you, they'll do incident reports, write them down, talk to the property manager, get all your information together, um, and then hound the builder. You know, most places, uh, the first couple years that you move into a place has a warranty from the builder, so hound them, find them, tell them what's wrong with it, force them to come back. Um, uh, sometimes they're willing, sometimes they're not. Um, Always, however, no matter what you do, keep in mind that there is a statute of limitations. But well, not to be a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> but you know, when associations are born, yeah. you know, the developer turns them over to a board. Oftentimes, that developer controls the board in the interim to the rest of the units are sold. And forgive me for being a non lawyer and saying, there might be a conflict of interest there. <laughs> but the reality it seems to me, how does that fit into the equation? You have a developer dominated board, or maybe it's not even a developer themselves, but people who work for them or whatever. Right. Uh, how does that fit into the equation of the statute of limitations? Well, it fits in poorly. Um, it, uh, it happens, and it happens often. I, I mean, uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, if I, once again, if I was king of the world, I can tell you what I would do to change some of the statutes. But one of the things that has always been a pet peeve of mine is you've got this quick statute of limitation, right? But in the meantime, you're still three years away from transitioning from the builder to the homeowner control. So then what do you do? The builder isn't going to point out these problems that he's created to the board. Uh, we have a case going on right now uh, out in Maui. Um, uh, it's close to the statute when we first got involved, the statute of repose, what makes it serious. But the builder has a representative and had, for, has, still does, for years on there. And every time the board tried to uh, say, we need to fix this, we need to take care of this, we need to call this builder, he'd obfuscate uh, for you layman. It means he'd confuse things. <laughs> um, uh, he was never helpful. He's still not helpful. They had to actually have a resolution amongst those board members that when we talked about the litigation that he wasn't going to be involved in any of this. So it is a problem. It's a big problem. And uh, in our opinion, if you've got a builder representative or the builder, you haven't even transitioned out, the statute of limitations should not even uh, begin running. Couldn't you make the argument that you put them on notice since he's the builder's representative, even though he's sitting on the board when you discussed all these things? You can. You can. You absolutely can, and we do, and we have. Uh, but once again, you know, when you're in front of a judge uh, who looks at the statute, right, and sees that okay, had uh, these folks had roof leaks, you know, uh, and then and then you didn't even send that notice to contractor that letter under 672 until three years later, potentially running into a statute issue, and so it's our job to convince the judge. Well, we wanted to, but we couldn't. 
And it's probably the best thing is for the board to take action earlier and avoid all the argument in the first place. They're going to spend legal fees to argue this statute of limitations issue that where if they had taken necessary action earlier, they, they could have avoided that particular argument or that particular challenge in this particular suit. Well, I mean, it's a fine line. I mean, we are homeowners, if, you know, for fortune, or lived in uh, AOAOs, associations. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I have never had a homeowner call me after they first found out about a roof leak, or their plumbing broke, or their got cracks. The last person in the world they want to call is a lawyer, and I don't want them to call me. Uh, I want them to call the contractor. I want them to call their cousin who used to be a plumber. Try to get it fixed. Do everything you can before you find a lawyer. In the meantime, you've got this quick statute, which is, therein lies the problem. Well, you may not know this, but I have special powers. <laughs> and so I'm going to anoint you king of the world yeah. and have you tell me what's wrong with the statutes and what should be fixed. Because you said if you were king of the world, you'd yeah. make changes. So I'm going to temporarily anoint you king of the world. We'll deal with North Korea and the rest of the thing shortly. But right now, let's deal with construction defect litigation. Small problems first. Um, well, the statute of limitations, like I said, is quick. and. There are so many different kinds of construction problems that associations and homeowners experience that you just can't put them all under one bundle of two years or you're out. Uh, there's uh, patent uh, construction defects, stuff that you can see, cracks, leaks. There's latent construction defects. I've spent the last, me and my firm have spent the last 15 years going over the country arguing plumbing cases. Those, the, pl the plumbing didn't break in the walls uh, uh, until years after a local statute ran. But unless you're Superman and can see through the wall, you wouldn't know that it's broken. It's got a small leak in there, but it's causing havoc, right? Um, so I would change that. I would move the statute of limitations, uh, pick a number. I would change it maybe six years for patent and eight years for latent. And, and that doesn't even, uh, uh, then there's some builders who've done all this on purpose, you know, to save money and, and uh, uh, nefariously, right? Um, I would uh, give it uh, 10 years. You know, you find that out during uh, litigation. Should be longer than that. Should be way longer than two years. So that's one thing. Mediation, we talked about a minute ago. I love mediations. Uh, that's part of the statute here. You send a notice to contractor, get him a chance to come back and fix. He does or he doesn't. Then before you can file your litigation, before you file your complaint, you have to mediate. Um, which is a great idea. Does it work? At that stage, most of the time it doesn't. Um, the mediations, well, the statute is stacked up against homeowners from beginning to end, including mediation. Everybody wants to mediate, nobody wants to litigate. I get all that. I don't want to. Um, but the, it's st the, the statutes are stacked up against homeowners because what they have to do is to get to a mediation, got to hire a bunch of experts, find out what's wrong, cost tons of money, hire an attorney who nobody wants to see. Um, our firm works on a contingency, most firms don't, so you have to pay attorneys. That takes months to do all that, the investigation, you go to the mediation, and then you sit down with the builder who doesn't even have to bring his insurance carrier who is driving the bus and all this stuff at the mediation and very seldom, almost never, do things get solved at that first mediation. Well, share with me, or I understand, but for our viewing audience, the difference between contingency, what I'm gonna call fee-based type program, and, and then after, we wanna do that in about a minute because we're gonna take a short break, okay. so give me a, a brief answer on that. Sure. Contingency uh, is what our firm has always done ever since I've been a lawyer, a baby lawyer. Uh, we uh, uh, work for an association or a homeowner or a group of uh, neighbors and we only charge them a percentage, a fee, at the conclusion of the case if you're successful. If you're not successful, then uh, they don't have to pay us anything. Fee-based is fee-based. You know, most lawyers work by the hour. Right. Um, uh, early on, I, I worked for an insurance defense firm, had to charge hourly. And I hated that, so I promised myself I would never do that again the rest of my life. Uh, so we charge a percentage, and hopefully at the end of the case it works out. Well, we can come back to that. I have a question on that. But we're going to take a short break. But since you asked me, you said pick a number for the statute of limitations. 
hey, I'm a owner, homeowner guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm voting for 100 years. So <laughs> that's where I'm at. But anyway, we're going to take a short break with Francis Lynch of uh, Lynch Hopper on construction litigation issues. And we'll be right back in one minute. Aloha. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe. And real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're having an exhilarating conversation <laughs> with Francis Lynch, who's an attorney. You know, uh, one thing, I, I love attorneys. They drive me to drink. Short drive, <laughs> but they drive me to drink. Uh -huh. but, but the reality of it is we're talking about very serious issues because we have so much new construction here in Hawaii, and I use Kaka'ako as an example, but it's really widespread throughout the island. And he was explaining to us of the short statute of limitations if you have a legitimate claim against a contractor uh, or developer with respect to a property, the importance of doing that. But we were talking about how expensive it is, and, and you were commenting that you can go on fee pay where you pay the lawyer by the hour, basically, and you have, so firms like yourselves that may do it on a contingency basis where you, you pay at the end, and it's kind of based on success in a way. Well, how about the costs and expenses in between, you know, because even if you're on a contingency, you'd have to pay for experts like me, who's very expensive. Yeah, you have I've, to, I've, uh, I've seen your they bills. Help. They are expensive. Uh, costs are uh, exorbitant. Um, and uh, we're only half an hour show, but that's another pet peeve of mine. That's why the deck is so stacked up against homeowners and associations, because the costs to pursue, even to the first level of mediation, are exorbitant. Um, in our experience, I mean, it ranges all, all of our lives. I mean, I've spent two, three, four million dollars in four years of litigation on cases, fifty thousand dollars just to get to the first mediation. Right? Our firm pays for all that up front for the, uh, the homeowner, um, but nonetheless, it's expensive. You know, it comes off the back end. But homeowners don't have that kind of money. Now, you were talking about you know it could be very expensive for experts and things like that. And, and did I hear you correctly that you said that my fees are extremely reasonable for the incredible <laughs> value and services I provide? Is that what I heard you say? That was exactly what I said. I thought so. Maybe I missed that. The power of TV. The power of TV. But anyway, only joking, because I don't do that much expert work on construction litigation stuff. I do mostly reserve studies and other condo issues. That being said, you're the board. You suspect you got problems. Kind of walk me through sure. what they should do and walk me through, I may have some questions along the way. Sure. If you have to get into the SUMI mode, kind of the steps. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, as an association, if you've got complaints or you see problems, roof leaks, water leaks, whatever they may be, first thing you do is, like we talked about before, just take, you know, take a deep breath. Get organized as a group. Um, be proactive. Find out what the problems are. Uh, as association board members, you hear everything every week, every complaint known to man every week, right? Um, it's important that if you go forward with litigation or even mediation or do it on your own, it's important to narrow down the issues. Only go after the big issues, roof leaks, plumbing issues. You know, we had, I, I, I mean, I've got 100 stories. You know, we had, we've had um, multi-million dollar cases um, in our career. But, uh, but in one case, for instance, uh, one board member was so enthralled about having her um, grills 
painted because she was convinced that the builder didn't paint the grills the right color. And so uh, she wanted that as part of the litigation. She wanted that first. And of course, that's not that important in the scheme of things. So as a board, proactive. Once you get to the point that it's, you've talked to the builder, he's not doing anything, he's shining you on, he's still on the board, he's got a representative there, you've made the tough, tough decision to find a lawyer. Once you've done that, then the real fun starts. Yeah, isn't there another issue as an example, and of course I know nothing about anything, <laughs> but the, imagine this, you have an association, they have some cracking, and so the contractor comes out and says, oh, I'll caulk that and cover it up for you. But then the board, and they sometimes are asked to sign some kind of settlement agreement or some kind of agreement that they accept that as a fix. That's right. And they don't look to see if maybe that's a structural crack that's going to come back again. Cosmetically, they could have covered it up for the short term. Mm -hmm. Aren't there hidden issues like that they have to consider and be really careful of? That uh, Because once they sign agreements and, and kind of go through this statutory issue of limitations, uh, they could leave themselves very exposed if they didn't do their due diligence. That's right, and I've uh, seen that too. Uh, if I had a nickel for every pound of caulk that uh, contractors come out to fix cracks, I'd almost be as rich as you. Um, that's what they do. They come out and they band-aid. And they come out and force you to sign something. I'm not gonna band-aid it unless you absolve me of all problems, right? That is um, a red flag. First of all, don't sign anything. Um, if that were to, if that were to be the case, uh, but at the end of the day, um, what uh, not only uh, is there expertise a lawyer can bring towards this process, but the experts that you've hired are vitally important. But if I understand your firm, what they do, and what we were talking earlier uh, off camera uh, before today was that. The boards who think they have problems, they can call your firm and you'll get an expert and you'll come evaluate it for them so you can really narrow the box. So they know whether the, by having an independent expert, they pretty much have done their business judgment requirement as a board, right? That's right. And in the meantime, it's not somebody else saying, well, I don't think it's that big a deal or I don't want to spend the money, you know, that your firm will actually do some forensic work for them when there's uh, issues are defined uh, to, to help them through that process. We do, and there's two points uh, that are real important. Number one, um, y you've been given a warranty, and so we recommend that evaluation uh, prior to the ex expiration of the warranty period, number one. Number two, prior to the expiration of the transition period before the builder leaves. Uh, we, do, uh, uh, we think it's important to bring out our experts. We do it for free. Uh, to give an evaluation, uh, not only to see if there's uh, systemic problems that are behind walls or you may not know about, uh, but it helps with your reserve analysis as well. You know what in 10 or 15 years uh, may end up by breaking down the road. This product here is good now, but we know that history tells us we know that product, but in 15 years that's going to break. So you need to put more money into reserves just for that product because we've seen it. And so it's important to do that kind of evaluation, at least at those two places. Well, so now you're aboard and they've hired a firm to come out, either an expert or an engineer or, or a law firm, and they have problems. Kind of walk me through the, the very simple, basic steps, what happens from then forward. Sure, sure. Uh, real quickly, uh, here in Hawaii, as in many states, there's a notice to contractor. You have the experts put an evaluation together. You send a letter to the contractor, give him an opportunity to come back and fix things. They may come back and fix some things, like in one case we're doing now, but they haven't fixed the major things, which unfortunately is typical. Um, and then at that point, when everything is not fixed to your satisfaction, to the expert's satisfaction, then you enter into the mediation, and we've talked a lot about that. Go there in good faith. Um, if the mediation is unsuccessful, then you can sue here in Hawaii under the statute. Once you sue, um, things happen pretty rapidly. You've already prepared your expert report, essentially. Uh, you serve the complaint. Uh, you know what the problems are. You start gathering all the documents. Uh, we had five million documents that we gathered in a case that we worked on for five years. Uh, that's important. 
uh, obviously. Once you gather the documents, that gives you some more questions to inquire about, depositions begin, you've been through that process. That's uh, super fun to go through, I'm sure you know that. Um, uh, after the depositions, uh, you get a trial date, and then just because you start your litigation process doesn't mean that mediation stop. And a lot of homeowners associations think that. The mediation is required by statute prior to litigation, but once you start the litigation, that's when the real mediations, the successful mediations occur. Yeah, my experience is the preliminary litigation mandated by statutes before any discovery's been done and any real work's been done. So it's, it's very hard to resolve until you get into the seriousness of having a lawsuit filed and you, and you look for more uh, whether it be mediation or arbitration, more formal ways to uh, sure. uh, to deal with this issue. So in, in, I know there's no standardization, not one size fits all, but if you had a sue and you started that process, from beginning to end, are you talking about six months, a year, two years? Uh, yeah, lifetime? it's, <laughs> it's uh, I, I wish I had a good answer. That's the first question everybody asks me. Sometimes, very often, they last three, four, five years. Very often. Um, and does it cost more than $20 to do this? Yeah, it does, unfortunately. Uh, it does cost more than $20. It's expensive. It's uncomfortable. Uh, I'm one of the few lawyers out there that probably convinces more clients not to go forward with the process than go forward. Uh, but once you've, in a board or a homeowner's made that decision that there's absolutely no other way to resolve this from your builder, um, unfortunately, there is that process that uh, we can help them with. Well, we have one minute left, believe it or not. All those have been very fun. It's fast. So what's your one piece of advice to the board if they suspect they have problems? Um, I uh, knew you were gonna ask that question. So I do have some recommendations. Number one, use common sense. Get all your ducks in a row. Uh, number two, uh, and more importantly, is preserve uh, the statute. Um, get that notice to contractor letter going, okay? That's, uh, that, that'll toll the statute, that'll begin the process. Um, and then if you decide to go forward, call us. We do the evaluation for you. Well, thank you for being on the show today. This has been very interesting, and like I said, there's a lot of new construction here in Hawaii, and boards, uh, I can tell you from experience as an association manager for years, sometimes in order to save money or, or they don't want to create bad feelings, they kind of push this down, kick this can down the road, and I would just advise them that the most important thing you can do for the homeowners that protect the value of their property, when you suspect you have a problem, Use your good business judgment and check it out and find out what the facts are. And on that note, aloha for watching. We'll see you next week. Actually, uh, Scott Shirley, my co-host, will be here next week, and I think he's talking about hoarding. So uh, <laughs> come back and learn all about hoarders and what you can do as a board or an owner to make your place more pleasant to live. Aloha.